Again, it seems odd, like just like last week, to preach a message like this at Christmas time. But, you know, I do believe that there are particular temptations uh, that we can be given to around Christmas time. You know, most of us have more time on our hands at this time. We are given to particular maybe temptations. We have more interactions with uh, people. And uh, like I said to the, the crowd who came to the uh, party yesterday, that some temptations of relationships are even um, multiplied in family reunions. <clears throat> you know, I say some things to my brother that I wouldn't say to anyone else on the face of the earth. Uh, there are times, you probably, you have uncles or aunts or people, the friction. Uh, I'm not sure why the Lord has led on these Sunday nights before Christmas to talk a lot about sin and temptation and the, a believer, uh, but he has. And so tonight I'd like to preach to you a message entitled, Preparing for the Adversary. Preparing for the adversary. Let's begin with a word of prayer, please. Thank you, Lord, for these folks, the family. I pray as we go through this word of God that you would please just uh, allow us to see your precious word and uh, that we would be warned by it and changed by it. And I, I do thank you that, that it is such a privilege to be able to fight sin for the glory of God's sake. Um, I thank you, Lord, that you are highly glorified when we make you the Lord of our lives and when we resist and uh, the culture, our, the world, and our own flesh, and the devil. And so, Lord, I pray that we would look, enter in this passage with joy, and we would see this truth, and we would grow by it. In Jesus' name, amen. Years ago, there was a comedian, and I, I feel like that every time I preach on the devil that I mention this, but years ago, there was a comedian that some of you uh, knew, and his name was Flip Wilson. And Flip, he, his, one of his main things was to make... Uh, comic jokes about the devil made me do it. Anybody remember that? You remember that guy, all right? <clears throat> so I thought that I would listen to one of them and just a little spiel so that I would be able to understand what he was saying. And in the spiel, it was a husband and a wife, and the husband was mad at the wife because she had bought this dress. And she kept on telling him she was just minding her own business, walking down the street, and the devil made her buy that dress. Well, that is maybe uh, a little bit of comedy in being able to blame someone else for what you do in your life. But I am here to assure you tonight that the devil never made anyone do anything. We all bear personal responsibility for our actions. According to James chapter 1, verse number 14, that says, Every man sins when he is drawn away of his, his or her own lust and enticed. And then sin goes on and brings forth death. It is our personal responsibility that causes us to, to make decisions that either obey or disobey the Lord. However, 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 I'm here to talk to you tonight about the fact that the playing ground of temptation is not even. What do I mean that? The fight against your fight against sin is not even ground. It's not just you against your temptation. We see from the very first man and the very first woman in the Bible that there is a lobbyist for sin who is a great enemy of God and his children that he is trying to entice and push your temptation and draw you and draw your desires into sin. We can call him a cheerleader, a lobbyist and a cheerleader of sorts. He is a cheerleader of sin and destruction. He is a grand manipulator who has one thing in mind towards you, to destroy and, de and to devour your Christian life. And tonight we would like to remind ourselves of this adversary so that we would be on guard and that we would be aware and uh, that we would know and understand that uh, we are not just going on in our Christian lives, you know, day after day after day, uh, without an adversary who is trying to, to destroy us. I just want to tell you this as we go through that there are some particular things even in my study of this this week that are I don't want to say new new thoughts they're not new thoughts but they're deeper thoughts on this subject. You may have a certain perspective concerning the devil and I hope that the Lord maybe would open your heart about some things new and understanding so that you may resist him tonight. Would you stand please 1 Peter 5 beginning in verse number 8. 1 Peter 5 8 says be, what's the first word? Yell it out. Sober. Be, what's the next one? Vigilant. 
because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, or like a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the, what's the next word? Faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, same, by the way, look up here, same conversation. Is it interesting to you that the word adversary, devil, and temptation is connected with the word suffering? Okay. After you have suffered a while, make you perfect or, or complete, mature, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. Notice first, please, the first commands, plural. The first commands, plural. It's in verse number eight. Look at it again. Be sober, be vigilant. The passage starts with two quick commands without explanation at all. It just gives them, all right? It's enough to hear the words concerning your Christian life in view of temptation and the evil lobbyist of temptation, the devil. It says, number one, be sober. <clears throat> number two, be vigilant. There is content in those two words. First of all, be sober. It is the same word that you and I, that in the Bible is used, that you and I would think of. We, would, we use it basically only one way now in our culture of someone who is drunken, of someone who, uh, who, 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 stay, who, who won't get drunken. He's, he's not drunken anymore. He is sober. It's used about intoxication in the scriptures as well. However, there's a much broader meaning that the New Testament uses concerning the devil's temptation other than just drunkenness. It means here, to be sober, to be clear in thought, free from distractions, we could use the word focused. So when the, when the Lord is saying, not just here, other places, be sober, he is saying, be clear in your thinking. Be clear. And you can, you can understand how that word applies to intoxication. Okay? The opposite. Okay? Be clear in thought. Be free from distraction. Be focused. And the idea of being sober so that you can detect, it's saying, be sober, be vigilant, da, 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 because why? Your adversary, the devil, he, he's coming at you. And so the understanding here is be, be clear in your thought, free from distraction, focused, so you can detect influences, temptations, patterns of thought in yourself and around you, coming at you, that could distract you so the devil could get advantage of you in some way. And so the first strategy, the first uh, command that is given is that it is possible for you to become distracted in some ways and unfocused in your Christian life so that you're easy prey for the lion who wants to devour you. So, that you, so he sees you as the weak antelope that the lion is going to chase. Be clear so that you can resist him. Be clear in thought, focused, so that you can see him coming after you. The ways this could happen of being intoxicated by distraction are nearly endless. I mean, I'm going to name some, but they are nearly endless. And about the time I say one, that's not what's going to cloud up your mind as a believer. Uh, entertaining small thoughts that break down your convictions can be intoxicating so that you can't see the devil coming at you. Um, uh, allowing doubt in your mind towards the things of God and it can cloud you and distract you and intoxicate you so that your walk with the Lord is no longer transparent. Medi meditating on temptation uh, until you eventually take that step and give in is intoxicating your mind. Becoming friends with someone who may cause you to be open to some sin or sinful talk that you weren't open to before is an intoxicant in your Christian mind. 
It, it clouds your judgment. Here is a friend being used of the devil to cloud your judgment so that the devil can take advantage of you. Getting pulled away to some seemingly benign interests that there's nothing wrong with whatever. Some hobby, some preoccupation, but that dulls you to being focused as a disciple of Christ. Becoming so enamored with that thing that in and of itself is benign that you are clouded to the fact that there is a, ooh, a wasp. There is literally a wasp. Where's security when you need them? I don't want to get stung. I don't know you, about you. The devil! <laughs> That's a full-fledged wasp, man, trying to take me down. See, if I was like hyper-spiritual, I'd say, the devil doesn't want me to preach this message to you. You send a wasp after me. Getting pulled away to some seemingly benign interests, but it so clouds your mind that you don't understand that the Lord, or excuse me, that the devil is distracting you from being focused on the Lord. You know, being sober-minded allows you to think honestly and clearly and truthfully concerning things that the devil may draw you into because your mind is clear, because you have knowledge that someone is trying to distract you. Certainly in the extreme sense, we can say, be sober, we can use it in the extreme sense. Uh, does alcohol, can alcohol, can, can pills, can substance abuse, can that cause you to be uh, intoxicated to the fact that the devil could take advantage of you? Yes, I mean, that is a very literal translation of be sober. Certain kinds of putting your mind on certain things can dull you. And I didn't know how to say this, and really I, w I was going to say like the dulling of communication. That doesn't make probably sense to you, but, but certain things like setting your mind focused on, on just one thing like uh, uh, a, a hobby horse of something like um, talk radio or the hobby horse of politics or, or of uh, just of even certain influences and in the culture of music or entertainment media can dull you, can, be, can make you distracted and, and so that you're not focused on Christ anymore and you're not focused in your Christian life to what your mission is and you're, e you're an easy pick off for the devil. The second command is there, be vigilant. Be vigilant. This word means to be watchful, vigilant, watchful. And, and I think probably the best way you could say this is expectant. I mean, you're watching for it. How many of you watch those natural, National Geographic, th you know, the things about animals and, and those, those different, I love to watch those programs, PBS and all that stuff. As you, as you watch those out in the, the, wherever, if Emma was in here, she could give you all the right words. She loves that stuff and knows all the right words. Out in those fields and those, uh, uh, valleys and those animals, those little antelopes and different things, they're just perking up their heads all the time. They're watchful. They, they're just waiting for the enemy. Why? Because it's been too many times that too many, you know, Floyd got picked off last week back in the back of the herd. And I, that's not going to happen to me. And so they're like up, you know, and then something little happens, just a little, you know, their ears go up and their tails go up and boing, 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 and they're gone, man. This is the word, be vigilant. I mean, just watching all the time expecting, knowing that, it, it, listen, if you don't believe in a literal devil, then don't be watchful. But the fact is, the devil is real. And he is, he's not, he's, he's always portrayed as very dangerous, very hideous, you know, and, and very uh, coming at you. God has warned you. Be expectant of his continual attack. It's real. There are daily temptations and attacks by the devil's minions. That's something we need to understand. This is talking, is the devil omnipresent like God? Can he be everywhere at once? Yeah, the truth of the matter is that the devil has probably never tempted or brought into temptation me or you. But the devil has minions. And the scriptures talk about principalities and powers and a third of the angels. I mean, there's, there's, there's millions of minions that he has that do his bidding. Watch for it. Beware. He is trying to devour you. Look at number two, the adversary, verse number eight. It says, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. When the Bible uses the word adversary to describe you and the devil, 
We need to take that very, very seriously. He is your enemy. The devil is not indifferent to you, for instance. He is against you. He's not like, oh, well, you know, so and so, you know, whatever. He wants to, the scripture uses of Peter, he wants to sift you as wheat. He wants to control you. He wants to steal the joy of your life. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy. He is that thief that Jesus was talking about. He wants to devour you. It is not what you have done to him that, that makes him hate you. It is what your master has done and decreed about him that makes him want to destroy everything that your master loves. You know one of the greatest things that your master loves? You. This is why the devil hates you and wants to rip you apart because the Lord loves you and the Lord has committed his love towards you. He is coming at you and he doesn't want to irritate you. He's not trying to irritate you. He wants to destroy your love for the Lord. This is not a small thing that he's doing. He is trying to destroy your love for the Lord, your consistency to serve the Lord, your godly marriage, your family, your thought life, your purity, etc., 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 And I want to tell you something really clear here. He is stronger than you. He is stronger than your willpower. He studies you to see your weaknesses, and he is no joke. He's not that thing that uh, you see played out on on television. This kind of this, this funny little animated creature that sits on your shoulder with horns. No, he tears, he'll tear out your heart with his mighty fangs if he can. He will rip you apart. He hates you and he hates your master. See how he's described in verse number 8? He is a roaring lion. The roaring part is a vicious, angry lion walking about, stalking, seeking whom he may devour. That tells us a few things there. He is powerful and he's vicious. He's like a lion. Uh, Probably there's not uh, anyone here that if you, if you had the opportunity to go to wherever lions live, you would uh, just go out in the bush and you just walk up. Hey, kitty, 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 Listen, I know what happens sometimes when we do that to our, our real kitty cat. She rips you apart. I can imagine the strength and power of a lion. He's powerful and vicious. He is stalking us, studying us like a lion looking for weakness to attack. Looking, have you seen those programs about a lion? Of when when the antelope or whatever, the deer, is not looking and puts its head down. That's when the lion creeps. When you're not looking, when you're not being sober, when you're not being vigilant, when you think you have it (coughs) all under control. I didn't write this in my message, but I think about it about it now. In in college, um, there was a I had a, a class pulpit speech, and you preached, and they videoed you, and they judged you and they told you what you were doing wrong and they refined you so that you would have a pulpit presence and and know how to preach and after one of uh, my sermons it it was I got an A on it and I was so excited and I was on a real high right it's those times and I I I'm sorry to confess to you that it was after that time that I fell to one of the greatest temptations in college what I'm saying to you is it's, some, it's when you think everything is going fine and when you think you're strong for the Lord, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. That's when the line is creeping up. He studies us. He's, he's seeking believers who are vulnerable in some way to get a foothold in their lives and destroy them. Look how verse 8 plays out. Walketh about seeking whom he may devour. It's like he's looking at many deer and he's looking for the weak one. He's looking for vulnerabilities in, per, in, in, in sick deer and those who are not watching him. Years ago, I did a skit as a youth pastor where my youth workers played uh, agents of the devil. And so the, the youth group was obviously in their seats and up front it was set up like a little business office kind of a thing. And there were individual um, people that would come in and they played demons. And they were agents of the devil, and they had laptops, and I had names of teenagers written down and, you know, made up kind of vulnerabilities or weaknesses in them that these, these demons were studying and discussing weaknesses in a certain teenager that they were planning to exploit. I believe that's how it is. I believe that's the, the stalking that the devil and his minions does about your life. 
The devil probably knows you better than you know you. He is brilliant. His minions know your weaknesses, and he's going to bring opportunities and thoughts and people and conversations and influences and situations to lead you into temptation to sin and sin and failure and destruction. And this is a constant thing. It's going to happen until the day you die. Him and his principalities and powers are organized, and they are very good at what they do. The great writer C.S. Lewis wrote a book about this very thing called the Screw Tape Letters. Have you heard about? Have you heard that? It's a classic. Okay, you find it in the library. The Screw Tape Letters. In the Screw Tape Letters, there is a a master demon, and uh, he is presented as an uncle um, who is sending. His name is Screw Tape. He's sending letters of advice and strategy to a younger demon named Wormwood, who is trying to destroy his patient, patient. He's called the one, the Christian who he's assigned to, that he's trying to bring down their life. And the master demon is giving C.S. Lewis, you know, by this time a committed believer, is writing incredible theology about who he calls the capital E enemy. He's talking about God. And he's giving, he's giving his nephew information about how to destroy the Christian that is his patient. And some of the things are just amazing, talking about our vulnerabilities and talking about our commitment to Christ and all of these things. You should read it if you haven't read it yet. Number three, notice in the text, please, the third command. Verse number nine, the third command. The Bible says, whom resist steadfast in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the Lord. The third command is the first part, whom resist, resist, don't give in, steadfast in the faith. That third command, whom resist steadfast in the faith, means resist to oppose him, to set yourself against him, to fight against him. Don't go along with him. You know, resist the lion with all that you have. Fight against him. Set yourself knowing that he is trying to destroy you. The end of that phrase can be translated steadfast in your faith. I think this is very important, so look at your Bible again there, the the first phrase in verse number nine. Steadfast in the faith. It can be translated your faith or just steadfast in faith. And the point is, don't take this like this. Steadfast in Christianity. Sometimes we call Christianity the faith, okay? That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about your individually individual faith and trust in the Lord. It's talking about that shield of faith in Ephesians 6:16 6, that we are to raise against the fiery darts of the wicked one, the devil. Resist him by firm, strong steadfastness in your trust in the Lord. In all the Lord has told you, in your faith towards the Lord. It is easy just to think of Satan's temptations like being tempted to lie or, or tempted to think some dirty thought or something like that. But many of the devil's worst temptations are much more sophisticated than that. And they are connected directly to attacking your faith. Your trust in the Lord and what the Lord has said in his Bible. They keep us, his attacks keep us from remembering the firm promises of faithful God, of remembering that he has been good to us in the past and that we can rely on him in the future. Think of Eve's temptation in the garden. It was connected to her faith. Satan suggests thoughts to her that undermine what God had said to her, causing her to lose faith in God. Eve's sin was not that she wanted to bite a fruit. Okay, Where she fell was in her faith, believing what God had said, in his righteous authority, in his goodness toward her, saying that his way was right. It was an attack on her trust in the Lord. When Satan said, hath God said you cannot do this, cannot do this? Satan's attacks are most often connected to our faith. I don't want to go out on a limb, but I will say that most temptations against us are an attack on our faith and our trust in God in some way, in some way. Or let me say it quite the opposite way. Most temptations against us physically or mentally can be resisted by a reinforced faith in the Lord and trust in him in some way. Let me say that again. Most of the temptations against us, whether physically or mentally, 
can be resisted by a reinforced faith and trust in the Lord in some way. So you're failing in a certain sin. I would ask you, what part of your faith is weak in that area? Let me give you some examples. God's way is best. That's a faith thing. I must not do this. This is not best. I must stop thinking this way. God is good to me. He does love me. Maybe temptations about his love. This may feel good for the moment, but I believe this will bring me harm and chastening as God said. Okay, there is reinforcing your faith and not doing something that may feel good for a moment. I will not think evil of her. God said I am to love her thinking no evil, and that is best. Okay, and there's, there's a reinforcement of your faith concerning, you know, thinking bad thoughts about some other woman. I will not steal this. God said, be content and give to others and wait for him to supply my daily needs. Okay, again, there's reinforcing your faith in something as small as as stealing. See, faith is at the center of many, many, many of our sin struggles. And so when when the scripture says in verse number 9 to to resist the devil, he says, whom resist steadfast in, in your faith, in faith. Number four, look at the fourth point tonight, the empathy and first encouragement. Okay, there's two encouragements in the text. The empathy and first encouragement. Sympathy is, can be defined as when I see somebody else and I feel bad about it. Empathy is a little bit more than that, when I see somebody feel bad about it because I've been there and done that, right? So this is, there's some empathy here found in verse number nine. Whom resists steadfast in the faith, look at, look at the empathy, knowing that the same afflictions, the same temptations, the same attacks of the devil are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Now, some of your Bible translations may use the words afflictions are experienced by your brethren. The word experienced instead of accomplished. All right, but that, I'm going to tell you, that is not a strong enough translation for this word. (coughs) This word is accomplished It means to bring something to fulfillment, not just to experience it. The verse is not saying, for instance, that other people are going through it. That's not all that that it's saying. It's saying that other Christians, your brothers and sisters in Christ, are not only going through it, they're gaining ground in it. And let that encourage you. This is both empathy and encouragement about the devil's temptations toward you. There are other brothers and sisters in Christ, and in times past, they're, they're even dead. In times present, even times future, if the Lord tarries, that are fighting the exact same temptations that you are fighting, and they are gaining victories in them. Not all the time, but they're gaining ground. Scripture says your temptation is common in 1 Corinthians ten thirteen. You know that verse? There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also give you a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. But the point of the verse I want to point out is it's common to man. Do you know why that's important? Because there's some things that Toby Whitmer goes through that, that I feel like no other Christian must have it so hard. And there's some things you put your name in there that you are fighting so hard against this and it just seems such like a hard thing to change in that area. Maybe it's your attitude or your jealousy or you're lying or maybe you're a thief. I don't know. But that area may seem so strong to you that you wonder if you can get victory. Hey, listen, there are, it's, it's a common thing. There are other believers that are fighting hard against that, that particular temptation. And the empathy comes that other Christians, brothers and sisters, are fighting. And in fact, some of them, I don't want you to think they all are, because they they got the same, you know, they they got the same Lord you have, same resurrection from the dead, same Holy Spirit you have. But some of them are gaining ground in this sin struggle. They are accomplishing the affliction. They are accomplishing the temptation. They are winning. So you fight. You know that other brothers and sisters are fighting very common things 
let that encourage you, that empathy encourage you to fight, encourage you to resist the Satan or, and his temptations. We would be absolutely flabbergasted if we would open the lives of everyone in just this room, somehow with some spiritual scalpel, open them up to see what temptations they are fighting against at this point in their lives. I think we would be shocked. We may not be, be able to look each other in the eye anymore. We may, we may just want to all quit. I don't know. But the point of verse number nine is that we can't quit, and we shouldn't quit, and, and we should continue to fight against the devil because there is some comfort knowing that we're not the only ones fighting our kind of temptation. Others are suffering under the same temptation, affliction, and gaining ground. You are not alone. You are not alone. The last point tonight is the second encouragement. Look at 10 and 11. The second encouragement. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect or mature, complete, establish, strengthen, settle you. Here is some great encouraging encouragement to you, and it's twofold. Here is the promise of God's grace over time. Listen to this, please. Listen to this. This is great for you to shoot out on your work day tomorrow, to, to, to shoot into your neighborhood, to do whatever you're doing at home, whatever. Here is the promise of God's grace over time in your Christian life, strengthening you to make particular attacks from the devil easier. Easier. It is not that they are easier in the passage. It is that you have grown stronger over time. The Lord has strengthened you spiritually. You've grown, grown stronger and stronger by walking with the Lord and learning about the Lord and learning about his strong ways. There's the little word grace in there. Look at it. But the God of all grace, that is, he is raining down, R-A-I-N-I-N-G, raining down grace and help for you fighting these temptations over time and you are becoming stronger and stronger against Satan's strategies and stronger and stronger to know the outcome and stronger and stronger to resist. You are becoming the, the scripture uses the word here perfect is, is the idea of mature. You're growing in maturity established. That means in a fixed position you're not losing as much ground anymore. You've planted your feet, and you're resisting much better. You've become strengthened. You're stronger than you used to be. You are more settled than you used to be, not knocked about every time that the lion starts chasing you. These are all words of maturity in a believer after enduring temptation that literally has wrecked you and tossed you many times. But over time, you become stronger. And over time, you become one of those people, and verse number, that verse number nine is talked about, you, are, you, you become a believer that in that particular temptation, you are accomplishing it. You are resisting it. You're not falling to it. You're getting stronger in that. Here is some encouragement for you, believer. Your sin fights with particular things right now will get easier as you become stronger and stronger in the Lord. There are things that are wrecking you right now that will be resolved, and I know it may be hard for you to believe that, that will be resolved and you will be victorious over them in a few years or, or hopefully in a few months. There is hope here. There is excitement to be stronger and gain victory and gain ground with the Lord's help, with the Lord's grace. But the second aspect of this promise, of this encouragement, is found in the words in verse number 10, Let's look at it again. But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after that you have suffered a while make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. The first encouragement is that you are growing stronger right now. But when you look at this term eternal glory, there is another encouragement here. Verse 10 and 11 are all, is also the promise that there is a day coming very soon for all of us where we will sin no more. Where Satan will have no possibility of devouring us. Where we will not fail in our faith. 
anymore. Where we will not stumble anymore. Where we will not fail to that same sin you have fought against for the last 20 days. You will not fall anymore. You will not be unsettled. You will not be discouraged in yourself. Wow, I can't believe I said that to that lady. I can't believe I had that thought, that attitude towards that, that guy. Where there will be no more temptation, no more fallen nature, no more sinful flesh in you. We will be 100% perfect, the words in verse 10, perfect, established. We will be fully mature because we'll be like Christ. Strengthened, settled, we will be like Jesus. And I would sure that every person, every sincere believer in this room would say that that day can't come too soon for you. Are you looking forward to that day? The passage ends with that joy and that thought about there's coming a day where the devil will have no more advantage, where he will never stalk me again. It ends with that joy, praising God and giving him the victory or the glory for that coming day of dominion over all sin and the devil. And it's in verse number 11. And I'd like to, re- I'd like to ask you all to read it out loud with me. All right, you ready? Verse number 11. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And that is just the final doxology, the final praise that there will be a a time where only the Lord has dominion. Tonight I warn you about a lobbyist, a cheerleader of sorts, who suggests, fuels, arranges, holds back truth, encourages temptation to you and in you, both physically and mentally. I don't know how he does it. He does it. The scripture says he does it. He is stronger than you, but God is on your side and has given you here strategies to resist him so God would ultimately get all the glory by your fight, your ever-growing strength, your gaining ground. God pitched this deceiver out of heaven for, for his pride and for his mutiny. Jesus mocked him openly on the cross, the scripture says. Jesus wrote his death sentence by the resurrection. He is bound for the lake of fire forever and ever, And he is raging mad. He knows that there is an appointment of judgment for him. And as mad and vicious as he is, he is that roaring lion every day, every day, every day, seeking to devour you. Beware. Beware, my brothers and sisters in Christ.